isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? I come to you from the United Kingdom with a message of hope and a message of optimism. It's a message that says if the little people, if the real people, if the ordinary decent people are prepared to stand up and fight for what they believe in, we can overcome the big banks. We can overcome the multinationals. We saw the commentariat and we saw the polling industry doing everything they could to demoralise our campaign. On the day of the vote itself, that morning, they put us 10 points behind. And actually, they were all wrong. And they were wrong because what the Brexit campaign did is we reached those people who've been let down by modern global corporatism. We reach those people who have never voted in their lives, but believe by going out and voting for Brexit, they could take back control of their country, take back control of their borders, and get back their pride. Folks, the message is clear. The parallels are there. There are millions of ordinary Americans who've been let down, who've had a bad time, who feel the political class in Washington are detached from them, who feel so many of their representatives are politically correct parts of that liberal media elite. They feel people aren't standing up for them and they've actually in many cases given up on the whole electoral process. And I think, I think that you have a fantastic opportunity here with this campaign. You can go out. You can beat the pollsters. You can beat the commentators. You can beat Washington. And now he joins us to the bottom of the hour, Nigel Farage, a major historical figure, uh, just a normal businessman, a family man who 25 years ago saw their sovereignty being destroyed, didn't get elected to office until 99, now the fastest growing party, not just in the UK, but Europe. And it's just classic Renaissance, Magna Carta, 1776, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's amazing to have been, been interviewing this guy for 15 years. It's been a few years since he's been able to come on. He joins us to talk about all of this, but the parallels between he and Donald Trump, where Trump's never been in office either, uh, are simply amazing. We're going to talk about it all. Here's the Washington Post, Financial Times, and others today. Saying with globalization in danger, G20 double down and are trying to defeat nationalism. They say if Hillary is defeated, it's the end of the new world order. This is an epic time. Uh, Mr. Farage, who just recently resigned as the head of UKIP, still in the EU parliament. Wow, talk about a David versus Goliath story. This is epic. Well, it is. And I think the point about Brexit, Alex, is Brexit is the first victory. We've had little victories. We've had, you know, the odd uh, election that's gone well for people in, whether it's in Germany or France or wherever it may be. Um, but Brexit is the first strike back against this phenomenon, this phenomenon of the big banks, the big businesses effectively owning politics, literally willfully destroying nation-state democracy, get rid of that thing that our forebears actually fought and shed their blood to create and to preserve our liberties, our freedoms, all of that being taken away and suddenly, suddenly in a referendum that no one said we could win. I mean, literally, nobody thought Brexit would succeed and we've done it. We've done it and I think what we've done is given inspiration to freedom fighters right across the Western world. Wow, where should we begin in the, in the limited time we have here, uh, Mr. Farage? Uh, the election here, uh, the, the, how Brexit? Yeah, well, let's talk about Hillary, shall we? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> if you can bear it. I mean, <laughs> Hillary represents everything that has gone wrong in our lives in the last couple of decades. She is part, a dynastic part, you know, of that class of people who have taken us into an endless series of foreign wars that I think arguably have made things worse, certainly in Libya and elsewhere, not better. Uh, she is part of that phenomenon where all that seems to matter now is corporatism. You know, the big global companies who want to set the rule books to effectively put out of business small and medium-sized competitors, they have destroyed you know, what I believe to be proper free market capitalism, where you or I can go and set up a company, you know, and have a real chance of succeeding. 
and they presided over a period where the rich have got richer and where ordinary, decent, working people have seen their living standards deteriorate. She represents failure. And she, of course, is completely unreconciled to the vote on Brexit because Hillary loves the European Union. She loves these supranationalist global type bodies. In fact, I think she sees the European Union as a prototype for an even bigger form of world government. And I would just say this to people. You know, I condemned Obama when he came to the United Kingdom during our referendum. He looked down his nose at Britain and the British people. He told us that if we dared to vote for our independence and our democracy, that America would basically throw us off the edge of a cliff forget about everything we've done and shared together, you know, over these last few years. Uh, and, and I condemned Obama for doing that. Um, so I'm not going to tell people how they should vote in the USA, but let me make it clear. If you want nothing to change at all, if you want to continue with the kind of cronyism that we see with the Clinton Foundation and everything else, if you want things to stay the same, you vote for Hillary. But if you think there's an opportunity here, particularly in the wake of Brexit, for us to start doing things differently in the Western world, then she's the last person you should vote for. And I said at the Mississippi rally, I said, I wouldn't vote for Hillary if you paid me. I said, actually, I wouldn't vote for Hillary if she paid me. And I feel pretty, str and I feel pretty strongly about that. Well, I mean, it's come out in the new WikiLeaks documents, which she admits are, are accurate that she's actually was selling influence to the Chinese president. I mean, this is even beyond espionage. I don't know how she and, 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 and speaking of the devil, uh, George Soros has tried to crash your country as well and did crash the pound. Uh, I, I, if you look at this, he wants the Internet to be run by the United Nations and basically the EU. He's come out now and said he wants the UN to run our police. And people laugh at that, but the UK got brought into the European Union without ever having a vote. These things are done by stealth. It's a real warning, I think, to the United States. Oh, yes, it happens incrementally, little piece by little piece. Uh, you know, we joined, just over 40 years ago, we joined something that my parents' generation were told, don't worry your little heads, this is just about trade, it's just about jobs, it's just about being friendly with our neighbours. And bit by bit, you know, we finished up in a situation where 75% of our laws weren't even made in the Houses of the Parliament, they were made in the European institutions. Uh, we finished up with a system where under the European arrest warrant, any British citizen could be extradited to Greece or Bulgaria or anywhere else without the production of prima facie evidence, which, you know, from the country that actually developed Magna Carta, it really is quite a surrender. Um, and we finished up, you know, we finished up being banned from making our own trade relationships and our own formal relationships with any other country in the world. And it's like the, the analogy, Alex, I've been given. It's like if you get a lobster, right? Yes. And you chuck it into a pan of hot water, it will shriek and shout and try and get out because it knows something bad's happening. They actually shriek. Yes, they yell. Oh, they do. No, they really do. But if you put a lobster into cold water, right, and turn on the heat, Actually, what happens is the lobster just gently falls asleep and finishes up being cooked. And I think that's what happened to the United Kingdom. We were put into cold water back in 1970. You thought it was a hot tub and you went to sleep and, wake, and woke up in an EU tyranny. Yeah, and I, you know, I was one of those people who, 25 years ago, and I, and I don't know quite how or why, but 25 years ago, I started looking at this. And I just said, this is Wrong. By the way, you Nigel, know, I don't, you don't like to talk about yourself, but this is a part of history. You were a successful business guy, your family guy, whole nine yards. It's been in the news. They've taken the, you know, the, the, the bolts off your car's tires. Even the French police said, looked like they tried to kill you. Your airplane crashed, mm -hmm. all this stuff. I mean, what made you 25 years ago decide to just strike out by yourself and now epically change the world? I mean, it's a success story for everybody out there. It's actually very simple. Uh, very, very simple simple indeed. You know, in every town, in every village in my country, uh, there are memorials, war memorials, to those that fell, both in the First and Second World Wars, fighting for us to stay as an independent, free, proud, democratic nation, and 
to stop tyranny in Europe. And I felt that what the European project was becoming was the very kind of tyranny that those before us had fought to stop. And nobody was asking me or telling me I had to put on a military uniform and carry a rifle. All I had to do was get involved and form a political party and get people to support it. And I've never wavered from that view in 25 years. The information... The information war, Nigel Farage, incredible. We've only got about 10 minutes left with you before we do another interview. Yeah. Uh, you've resigned from the party, but you're still in the EU parliament. You're still working hard. Uh, can you just briefly, for folks that want to know, explain, I mean, I understand, that for 25 years, why you've pulled back uh, right on the, I mean, after this huge victory. Yeah, well, there are two reasons. One is that there are two different types of people in politics. There are those who want to be something, who want the title, who want the chauffeur-driven car, who want the, you know, grandiose <laughs> sort of stage to be on. But there are other people in politics because they're in it for a purpose. And my specific purpose was to free my country from this European project. So having achieved that goal, I said, look, I'm not retiring. I'm not moving up into the mountains and living in a, you know, living in a tin shed. Um, but I'm going to step back from leadership. And that's going to leave me free to make this argument not just in the United Kingdom, not just in the EU Parliament, but around other parts of the Western world. And when you and I met each other in Cleveland at the Republican Convention, that was the first time in years I'd been free without having to represent a political party to go out and look around the world. Um, and I will, you know, as I'm talking to you tonight, I will make these arguments in the American elections and I will go around the free world saying to people, let's take back what we've lost. The second reason, if I'm frank, is that doing this for a quarter of a century, uh, doing a job that absorbs you 24-7, leaves exhausting. you no time, leaves you no time to catch a fish, leaves you no time to see your kids grow up. I, you know, I'm now going to work, Alex, 50 or 60 hours a week, not 100 hours a week. I get it, sir. I totally understand, and thank God you, you created UKIP. I mean, you're a model. I mean, everything else. Look at how every EU country has a major... Brexit style movement and the polls show uh, that we're going to see huge victory here. So I want to talk about that in a moment, how the empire is going to strike back, how the socialists and communist bureaucrats and mega banks are going to strike back. But uh, getting into overall what globalism uh, is, is up to these days, are they crying foul and saying that they're in deep trouble uh, as a way to get governments to desperately go along with them? Or is it accurate that they're on their heels? I mean, I've got a stack of news articles here saying U.S.-led globalism is dying. And, of course, they mean globalist-run globalism is dying yeah. uh, with the TPP. Yeah. Uh, New World Order in trouble. Uh, Soros in trouble. I mean, they, they claim they're in really, really deep trouble. And I look at the facts. It looks like they are. But then I ask, how are they going to bring us into a depression? Uh, are they going to crash our currencies again? I mean, this is the usual suspects. How is the empire going to strike back? Uh, the empire is bewildered. The empire is befuddled. The empire still cannot, just as I said about Hillary earlier in this interview, uh, the empire doesn't get Brexit because the empire didn't believe Brexit was possible. And now the empire's problem is that it's fighting this argument on several fronts at once. You know, we've got the uh, American elections going on. Uh, we've got... Um, a big referendum coming up in Hungary on migrant quotas from Germany. Uh, we've got a rerun of the Austrian presidency where the right-wing candidate was cheated uh, by, by false votes. Uh, so they've got a real problem. They are fighting us now on a whole series of fronts. Uh, what will they do to fight back? I don't know the answer to that yet. And do you know something? Nor do they. Because over the course of the last few decades, all of their plans, piece by piece, to build these new structures, they've won every single battle. Some of them have taken them longer than they wanted, but they've won every single battle. After Brexit, they're in trouble. And, and I have to say that uh, these American elections, you know, this could be a result globally far bigger even than Brexit. You know, if America, if America as the leader of the Western world once again becomes the leader of the free world, well, then I think, uh, basically, uh, we, we, we will have done away with the globalists. Well, sir, you're right. The Washington Post said two weeks ago that Hillary's a referendum and that Brexit was the first domino 
and that she's the second, and if she falls, they say it's irrevocable because they, in, in their own documents that we've gotten from BAMP Canada, North American Union meetings uh, 10 years ago, they admit, they say, it's key that we maintain stealth and secrecy. If the public ever finds out, North American integration and our plan will fail. That's a quote. I mean, it's like a James Bond villain. We've caught them. You've exposed them. I don't see how they can continue uh, when it comes out that they're dictatorial. But first, since you mentioned Hillary, I don't know if you saw her big national speech last week. She attacked myself, you and others. She, she, she attacked Donald Trump like it was bad that he was associated with somebody like you uh, who's changing the world and, and loved all over the place. Even the left is having to admit you've got good points. And, and so let's play this clip of Hillary acting like Trump's bad because he's modeling himself after a winner like you. Here it is. Nigel Farage, who stoked anti-immigrant sentiments to win the referendum, to have Britain leave the European Union, campaign with Donald Trump in Mississippi. And then Paul Watson in the piece he did on this went on to say, hey, Hillary and Nigel Farage won. Don't forget that part. I think this really illustrates her, her disconnect, sir. Well, I just want to, can I please use this opportunity to thank Hillary Clinton from the bottom of my heart <laughs> um, uh, for doing what she's done. Uh, she's raised my profile massively <laughs> in this presidential election. She's made me a political football uh, between the Trumpites and the Clintonites, and she's given me an even bigger platform in the United States of America <laughs> to say to people, we've just won our democracy back. Why don't you do the same thing? So, Hillary, thank you, thank you, thank you. So he he here's the paradox. They've got the money, they've got the power, they've stolen control, they've got the Swiss bank accounts like the EU bureaucrats that don't pay taxes. You've exposed all that, but people are waking up. They're unelected, they're dictatorial. That's an uphill battle for them. The problem is they're already on top of the hill. How do you see this playing? I mean, I, I, in fact, I agree with you. They don't know how to counter. They're panicked right now. I've never seen the media so deceptive. They seem to be doubling down. Yeah, what we've got to do, what we've got to do is to focus on what we can do. And what we can do is to go out and reach the millions, tens of millions of people across the Western world who frankly feel completely disconnected and disenchanted with politics. You know, they, we've, we've been through these years where, frankly, whichever party you vote for doesn't make very much difference. And where people say, do you know what? I'm not going to bother. It makes no difference. And what we have to do is we have to inspire those people. We have to say to those people, come on, get up off your backside, get down to that polling station, vote, because it's only by us getting together and doing what we think that we can change things. And that's the lesson, Alex, from Brexit. Nearly two and a half million people who don't vote or have never voted in their lives went out on June the 23rd and turned it into our independence. To and total history. And, and, of course, they're trying to ignore the vote. It's a battle, but they're going to lose in the end. This is amazing. They can't. They can't. In the they minute we have left. The they can't ignore the vote. So I would say to people, if you want change in America, then, yeah, listen to these shows. Talk to your friends and neighbors. But actually, you've got to get your walking boots Knock on. on doors. You've got to get out and meet people, inspire people. And if you do that, we'll strike a blow against the globalists from which they will never, ever recover. Absolutely. In the minute we have left, sir, I just want to say that obviously you've not really retired. You're here battling the New World Order globally now. You've actually gone to the next level. And I appreciate your time, your, your energy, and, and the risk you've taken uh, for yourself and your family. Uh, of course, UKIP.org, uh, the former party you headed up. And of course, people can also follow you on Twitter. We'll put that on screen for TV viewers as well. Uh, but this is a great historic time. It is a referendum uh, against the new world order. And I think Donald Trump's going to win if all of our listeners and others do what you say uh, and, and take action. So thank you for spending your time uh, trying to help uh, uh, America be a free country as well, uh, Mr. Farage. No, not one little bit. And I'll be back between now and November the 8th. Thank you so much, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you.